what we're talking about. And I think you can highlight two aspects of emptiness, uh, two, uh, two ways of looking at it that may help to, to clarify the picture. These, I would say, are um, insubstantiality and uh, a lack of independent existence. And what we're referring to in the, as being empty, in the big picture, it, it's everything, but specifically it's uh, every occurrence, every event or phenomenon. In the uh, Abhidhamma, uh, most of the uh, most of the Abhidhamma is based on a model of reality as being uh, made up of what are called dhammas, which are individual occurrences. Um, it's, a, it's a kind of atomic theory or model. One modern uh, translator has translated dhamma in this sense as point instant which I think is quite good because uh, a point mathematically is, is a zero dimension unit of space and a moment is uh, or an instant is in time is uh, uh, a moment of zero duration. So a point instant is um, a, a pretty good evocative translation of the idea of dhamma, and the and so it's the it's these dhammas which make up reality as we perceive it, and the teaching of emptiness says the dhammas themselves are void; they're empty of substance. So this is an insubstantiality. In uh, Indian thought, there there was a uh, going back before the Buddha, and in in uh, schools like Samkhya after the Buddha, there was um, a concept of svabhava, the own essence. And this is parallel to. Uh, in Western thought, uh, from Aristotle, there there was the idea of things having substance and qualities, and the qualities are changeable, but the substance is integral. Right? As this is the essence of a thing, is its its own essence, svabhava. Um, the Buddhist contribution is to see that uh, the Swabhava, as it was understood, is not a reality. There is no own essence to anything. Uh, um, the things, the Dhammas, are the qualities, and they're they're unitary and immediate and um, uh, non-persistent. So this is tied in with the idea of impermanence, which is another key philosophical concept, that things only exist for a single moment, that essentially flashing in and out of existence. And existence itself is without uh, inherent substance. So in terms of this Dhamma model or Dhamma theory, we don't say that uh, such and such a thing is uh, has the quality of, of hotness or the quality of redness or whatever. We, we, we see that 
uh, redness or hotness is itself a dhamma. It's a momentary <coughs> occurrence and there's no substance behind it. It's just a uh, immediate flashing of in and out of the void. So there's a lack of substantiality. The other uh, aspect or other way of looking at it <clears throat> is to say lack of independent existence. That there are no self existent standalone entities anywhere. Uh, this is a trick of the mind that we define things in this way. There is only relations. This is the, the uh, dependent, dependent arising. Nothing exists without a cause and nothing exists uh, with a single cause. There is a infinite network or matrix of forces, dynamic forces that we perceive entities only as um, uh, as an illusion that there is really only momentary combinations of of causes, of forces, of energies that uh, come together to be perceived as <clears throat> a thing, an entity. And nothing can be defined as, a, as an independent entity. When you look at anything, you can only see it as a product of other things. So one way of phrasing this that I've seen is <clears throat> nothing exists from its own side. Things only exist from the outside, looking on. <clears throat> but nothing has a self-existent quality. Now this way of looking at phenomena as being empty, as being insubstantial and without self-existence is actually pretty close to modern uh, physics uh, model of reality. Uh, reality existing only as a probability function and discrete entities only exist when the wave function is collapsed by an observation. Uh, the uh, actual reality is uh, an infinite range of possibilities. So the emptiness is the same as as fullness. As long as it's it's empty, as long as it's void, there's an it's, it also has an infinite potential. So this uh, philosophical definition of reality as being empty uh, underlies much of the Buddhist teaching and it's, it's integral to it. And how it uh, applies to the human existence is the uh, teaching of anatta or not-self. Uh, this is a specific application of the general idea of emptiness. This is taking what well, a universal model and um, using a, a psychological application. So looking at the human being as in the same terms as the rest of the universe, the human being is essentially without self-substance, without an own essence, and also uh, is entirely uh, dependent on causes and conditions, 
no one is uh, completely uh, independent. <clears throat> Uh, one of the uh, principal ways the Buddha talked about not-self was an analytical method of examining the human organism in its parts, the, the component parts, particularly in the model of the five khanda, the five aggregates of being, the body, feelings, perceptions, mental formations, and consciousness. Uh, one physical, four mental aggregates that make up a human being and not finding anywhere a essential uh, self. No? The, the classic um, simile is the simile of the chariot. You, break up a chariot, you know, this was a, from the questions of King Melinda. Uh, Nagasena, the monk, asked, uh, uh, was trying to expound um, not-self to the king. And he said, he asked the king, how did you arrive here today? And he said, I came in my chariot. So Nagasena says, if we were to break up the chariot and put the uh, baseboard here and the backboard there and the axle here and the wheel there and so on and a big pile of, of pieces could you find in that in there the essence of chariot and Negasi, and Melinda says no no this is just a pile of parts and pieces well what is a chariot a chariot is only a name a designation we give to describe these parts and pieces when they're arranged properly and functioning, then we call it a chariot. But we can't find, if we tear it apart, no matter how small we tear it apart, to tiny little pieces, we'll never find the essence of chariot. So it is with a human being, he goes on to say, you know, if we take the, uh, the body the, and um, consciousness, perceptions, feelings, mental formations, and examine them, and all of these are compound. We can take them apart further and look at individual functions and units. We know where to find the essential essence of self. What we call a person, Nagasena or, or the King Melinda, is only a, a name, a designation that we give to these forces when they're operating, functioning in a certain way. So the idea of an individual is a mental construction only, a, a fabrication, a convenience, a convention. <clears throat> and when we look inside, and we examine the workings of the mind, we know where to find this uh, essence of the self. It doesn't exist. It's also, you could say, the idea of the self is uh, intellectually redundant. It's non-explanatory. It doesn't add any information to the understanding what's going on. To see what I mean, let's update the analogy of the, um, the chariot. And let's say it's uh, Melinda's Toyota. Yeah. <laughs> and... Melinda's just bought this new Toyota and he's real happy and pleased with it. He, uh, he's, but he doesn't know anything about auto mechanics. So he's, he's come up with a theory on his own that there's a, a green goblin that lives under the hood and it makes everything go. And his friend Nagasena is a class A mechanic. And he says, you're crazy. There's no green goblin in the hood. What are you talking about? And he says, well, what makes the wheels turn around? Well, that's the, the, the crankshaft it, turning. It transmits the energy to the axles. Okay, well, what makes the crankshaft turn? Well, it's the, the pistons going up and down in the cylinders. Okay, well, the green goblin is driving the pistons up and down. Then. 
No, 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 no. There's a spark plugs are firing and exploding the gasoline. Well, okay, well, the electricity for the spark plugs comes from the Green Goblin. No, no, no. That comes from the distributor cap. You know, you can go on and on and on and explain every detail of the functioning of the car without any reference to a Green Goblin. You know, it's only a, a convention, something that's kind of if someone who's completely ignorant of how a car works, you can make that up and make it sound plausible. Mm -hmm. But it's completely unnecessary. It actually doesn't explain anything. And that's like a self in the, in the functioning of a human being. When you examine the, what's going on in body and mind, you see that there's nobody home. <laughs> there's no green goblin under the hood. There's the mental qualities of perception, of consciousness, of feelings and mental formations and the physical form of the body. And we can examine how these different components work and function and nowhere do we find uh, a self. There's no entity doing it. The, the simplest um, experience of reality when we do methodical meditation of uh, introspection, kind of Vipassana meditation, we're looking at the functioning of the body and mind. All we ever see is an object and mind being conscious of the object. There's only an object and a subject and there's nobody doing anything. There's no third agent. No, there's just an object and mind knowing the object. And they're both intrinsically empty. They're both void. Both the subject and object <coughs> are without self-substance, without an own essence, no svabhava to be found. And also they're dependent. They arise only due to causes and conditions. So they're not self-existent entities. And this is all that's going on. Yeah. <clears throat> and when we uh, begin to see things in this way, and the more the more we can apprehend things in this way of, of, of emptiness, of not me, not mine, then the more uh, open and uh, liberated and expansive the mind becomes and anxiety and fear drop away if there's nothing if there's nothing to lose there's nothing to fear uh, the mind becomes very uh, lucid and clear and this is uh, in the essence of waking up. <clears throat> but we've been conditioned from um, many lifetimes to experience reality in terms of self and other of discrete entities. Uh, and this has, uh, uh, this is the uh, fundamental illusion, but it, it's a kind of natural response of, of uh, biological beings. You know, where uh, this human existence, where biological entities that have a you know physical form, and we relate to the world and our form is at least in part shaped by um, evolutionary pressures over many many uh, uh, millions of years and much of our way of perceiving and operating is comes from that that uh, that heritage you know, this, <clears throat> Like the, the feelings, pleasant, unpleasant, neutral, 
<clears throat> seems to me that that is a very primitive level of mentality that's you know really deep in our being is even a even a one cell a one celled animal probably has some degree of, of feeling in that sense and that there'll be things in the environment that are dangerous to it poisonous or predators or uh, and then those are perceived as unpleasant and to be avoided and there are other things in the environment that are perceived as pleasant because you can either eat them or mate with them and that's about the only things in the environment for an animal that are you know, felt as pleasant and the vast majority of things are neutral you can't eat me and I can't eat it it's, um, it's, I'm just neutral I just ignore it uh, and this, these impulses are useful for survival. Um, but they're not an expression of reality. They're, it's just a mental reaction. You know? And we get uh, to the level of human beings who are very sophisticated mentally relative to primitive animals but we still have building on that same substructure and it's uh, uh, a functional all these kind of mental faculties are functional but they're not they're not essentially real and perception is another one of the mental qualities uh, sanya in Pali. This operates alongside sanya, or, uh, or, or sorry, sanya operates alongside vijnana, um, which is consciousness operating through the senses. And it's this is the way we essentially construct the world we actually live in. You know, we think we're living in experiencing an outer universe, but actually we're not. The outer universe is something we can never know directly. We only get a limited range of data through the senses. The eyes take in a range of electromagnetic energy. The ears take in vibrations in the air and a limited range and so forth, and we get these signals through the, uh, the sense organs as little, little packets of data. And it's not, the, it's not the whole universe, it's only little, little signals coming from the universe. And then perception picks that up and creates a simulation that we actually experience, that we actually live in, based on the external information. So it's said, for example, that the eye sees, doesn't, the eye does not see a man, a woman, a table, a chair, a dog, a cat. The, the eye only sees color and shape. And perception knows these other things and essentially creates them. There's a creative aspect to perception. Uh, when it's functioning well, and if we're, you know, normal, sane, relatively sane human beings, then our perception is a, a workable model of the external universe so that we can function and deal with stuff and, you know, not, not walk into walls. And, you know. um, but it's still, it's a model. It's a secondhand reality. And we can verify the, that there's a, a creative aspect to perception is... Um, a common experience, I think everybody at some point has probably done this, is, is being outdoors and relaxed and lying on your back on a sunny day and looking at clouds in the sky and letting the mind just play with the images in the clouds. And you can see faces and animals and, you know, if you persist with it, they can become quite detailed. And this is the perception creating these 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 things right from the sense data 
And when we sleep at night, we dream. This is perception that's untethered from the sense data. And now it's free to make stuff up just based on fragments of memory and imagination. But it's the same quality. So we're essentially dreaming this world as that we walk around in, but in the waking state, if we're functioning normally, then the, the dream is based on data coming in from the outer world and it's very constrained to be real, as realistic as possible so that we can function. But we never touch the outer world directly. It's only this perception. So the, and the perception is uh, not 100% reliable. It's good enough most of the time to function. But we know it can also be fooled. We can have uh, misperceptions, hallucinations. The common example given in some of the old texts is uh, in, in the twilight, mistaking a, a piece of rope for a snake. Yeah. And this is, you know, the, uh, the mind plays, tr we, we say the mind plays tricks, right? And, and this, again, this ties into the survival quality because you're, you need to be, you know, if you're living in uh, a place with poisonous snakes, you need to be on the alert to see snakes. So the mind will perceive a snake based on very limited cues of information. So not to, not to be fooled by the quality of perception. And this is one of the, the elementary illusions that uh, misunderstandings that people have and they fall into is what's called naive realism, to just assume that what you see and hear is, is actual reality. And this is na naive realism. And um, this is one of the ways in which we misperceive the world and create a substantiality that doesn't, that's not there. On a psychological plane, what, uh, what the, the primary illusion that the Buddha was always trying to find ways of dispelling is the illusion of a substantial self, the, the self-view. And this is a very persistent and uh, difficult illusion to shake off. We're very uh, conditioned to um, take this conventional self, this mental construction as a reality, to assume a reality to it. And it has uh, at least, and it's one of the reasons why it's, it's difficult to shake off completely is it has at least three levels to it. Uh, the first is the personality view, Sakaya Ditti. Uh, which literally means the, the uh, own body view. And this is a, uh, a confusion at the level of, of view, of ditti, or we would say uh, uh, maybe the cognitive level. It's a way of understanding. A view, a, a ditti in Pali is, a, is usually translated view, is something deeper more than, um, than an opinion or a belief. The opinions and beliefs arise out of ditti. Ditti is the underlying assumptions that we make about reality. Something like uh, um, in Western philosophy, there's a German word, Weltanschauung, uh, world, world view. It's kind of like your underlying way of understanding the world that then can become elaborated into theories and opinions and philosophies, but a 
many times it's not. It's just an implicit as assumption. It's not unexamined, but it's there. And uh, the ordinary person has an underlying view of uh, I, I am, that this personality, this body-mind system is, is, uh, is a persistent integral reality, a substantial standalone entity. Uh, and this is uh, this is the the first or most superficial level of I making, and it's only fully overcome uh, by the stream enter, first stage of awakening. Before that, there will always be a, at least a trace of I am personality view present. But it can be, but it, because it exists at this cognitive level, you can attenuate it by examination and understanding of um, the functioning of body mind, and not finding a self anywhere and seeing everything as dependent and interrelated. There's a Zen story about the man searching for the owner of the empty house and not finding him and then asking who is doing the looking then there's a even when this is overcome there's still a deeper level of self-making that's based on uh, desire um, this is not at the cognitive level, but it's more at the, the emo emotional or appetite of level. That there's a, uh, we could call it a kind of a selfishness. So that they, even a, a stream winner who has completely eradicated the idea of a self as a, as a concept could still at times act selfishly. Maybe take the last cookie off the tray you know, because even though I don't believe in it, I don't conceive in any way of a self-entity, I still want that cookie for me. <laughs> <laughs> this is a deeper level, right, of self-making underlying. And that's only overcome by the um, third stage of awakening, by the anagami. Uh, but there still remains, even to the anagami, there still remains a very subtle level of self-making that's uh, it's called asmi mana it's called the i am conceit in english is the usual translation and it's actually not a bad it's kind of loose but it's not a bad translation mana is a, like a construction of the mind and conceit in english has this double meaning of um conceit like uh, someone who's overly self-regarding a conceited person but it also is a conceit is like a notion or, a, or an idea, particularly like a silly idea someone has. It's, he has a conceit. It's kind of an older use of the word, but it's, uh, it's, it's one of the meanings of the English we can see. Um, and this is said to exist on the level of perception, uh, which is uh, interesting. Now, we talked about the nature of perception of sanya and its creative quality. So we the, we can create the world with sanya as being centered around a self, and this is the I am conceit. You could say it's like a privileged point of view, like this here I here is the center of the universe um, and it's not it's not a belief and it's not an emotion it's a perception it's a way of perceiving it's a, the angle at which we look at things so this is the very subtlest level of self-making and to uh, 
begin to attenuate and transcend that level, we need to uh, understand better and stop believing in our perceptions as fundamental reality. If all my perceptions are essentially creations of the mind, then uh, it's also the sense of the self is also a creation of the mind. So I'll just uh, summarize and uh, wrap it up by saying that um, this uh, teaching of emptiness is something that's uh, very central, essential to the to the understanding of the Buddha's teachings, and it's something not to be taken uh, uh, not to be taken for granted or to be just thought of as a, uh, a verbal formula, but something to be investigated again and again, to look at the, the, the emptiness of things. And it, it's something that can reward uh, exploration, uh, to try and get beneath the surface appearances and really understand the essential nature of, of self and, and world. So I've got uh, time for questions. Carry on. Yes. When one feels anxiety or is having difficulty, and it kind of seems like there's a goblin in the car and or mobile ones. Um, What does one do? Okay. Um, one simple practice that um, uh, I found very useful is the verbal formula, not me, not mine. Whatever you're looking at that you're feeling is causing anxiety or fear, you cease to identify with it. And don't take ownership of it. You can just remind yourself, not me, not mine. This is just a phenomenon. This is a shorthand. This not me, not mine is a shorthand for one of the Buddha's teachings about uh, not self was to look at the five khandhas and examine each one in, in turn and say um, that the body is not me, the body is not mine, I am not in the body, the body is not in me. I am not feelings, feelings are not mine, etc., etc. So the shorthand is not me, not mine. And you apply it specifically to this, you know, not as just a general concept, but as specifically this thing that's bugging me. <laughs> this is not me, this is not mine. You, you think we, we live before we are awakening in a world of ignorance? Yes. Yes, we're, we're everyone who's not an arahant is, is some degree of ignorance. <laughs> not knowing. Of course, there's, it's degrees, right? Some people are much more ignorant than others. <laughs> but, but, uh, you know, we should always be trying to um, reduce and minimize and move away from our ignorance. But it's start by recognizing that it's there, that we don't know. We don't, we don't initially understand things. So, what does the world look like to you once you move past this concept of self? Um, well, there's 
there's a change in perspective in that um, the mind no longer orients everything in terms of of uh, me and mine so you can it, it's it's liberating in that in, you, you, you throw off this kind of um, constrained perspective like before uh, you know the initial initially of beings essentially relate to the world in terms of what's in it for me right? it's like um, it's only what relates to me either as a desirable object or as a threat that that I take notice of so not fully awake you're just reactive when you get rid of the sense of me and mine then you're 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 liberated you perceive things in a more expansive open manner and um, uh, you're more clear you're more awake you have more you have more energy because you're not your energy is not being constrained within these narrow bounds is it right to think that like all fear or, or anxiety comes from a sense of self or I yeah yes it's that's true because that uh, if that's one of the qualities of the of um, enlightened being is fearlessness because they know uh, there's no self position to defend it's only the sense of of uh, of a self or a loss of loss of the self or threats to the self that you know, from which fear and anxiety arise. So when you're using that shorthand, like you said, of not me, not mine, what is the, the emotional quality behind it? I, I'm asking because I, I recently had a little bit of a kind of panic attack, which mm -hmm. I've never had before. Mm -hmm. and, in the middle of it, I was trying to bring it down, feel the body and all of that. Yeah. But in doing that, there I could still feel um, a pushing away of yeah. what was happening. Even okay. though I was saying not me, not mine, but the lot of Yeah. Well if it if you're if you're really doing it properly it should be um emotional tone of equanimity. You know, if it's not me, not mine, then it, it, it's something I, do, I neither desire nor fear. It's just, it's, it's irrelevant to me, right? It's just, it's just like, uh, uh, there, there's a story of the Buddha uh, teaching his monks, and they're in a, uh, a park, it's a royal park, and they can see in the distance there's some people from the village have come to gather firewood sticks and they're carrying away bundles of sticks and the Buddha says to his, his uh, monks, he says, monks, you see those villagers taking away the firewood sticks. When you see that, do you beat your breast and rend your garments and wail? Oh, no, no, they're taking away the sticks. And the monks, no, we don't care. <laughs> Nothing to do with us. <laughs> So, so the Buddha said, so it is. That's how you should regard the body, perceptions, feelings, mental formations, and consciousness. Mm -hmm. it, it, it's not, it's, so it's being threatened, so what? Not me, not mine. Mm -hmm. So they're taking the firewood sticks away. <laughs> <laughs> Aesthetic's not the right word, but equanimous, equ like a neutral feeling. 
you're not apathetic because you still, uh, you know, fully can fully engage in things, but you're not you're not invested in them. Compassion is a whole another another thing, and you know, it's be a whole a whole another topic. We do a whole easily do a whole talk on compassion. Um, and it, I probably should say you know, something about it here because it is an important balancing factor. Uh, the teachings I've been speaking about this evening would, would classify as wisdom teachings. Uh, and compassion is another part of the whole package. The Buddha two supreme qualities are wisdom and compassion and if you have one without the other if they're not both developed you're going to get in trouble mm -hmm. if wisdom without compassion is is cold right it's it can, it can be a ruthlessness to it even um, as a historical example there was some of the, the uh, samurai warriors in Japan misapplied the Zen teachings on emptiness and held that when they killed somebody with their sword, there's no, no harm done. There's just an empty atoms moving through empty atoms. Um, but compassion recognizes the suffering of beings. As suffering as a reality is a sub subjective reality and uh, even though the beings themselves are not essentially real the suffering is real and uh, one should have you know have an open heart to try and uh, accommodate that and deal with it but compassion without wisdom just leads to uh, usually doing more harm than good and you just you just blunder into situations and cause trouble when you're trying to help people, right? Because if you're not guided by uh, wisdom and understand um, the results of actions, and I'm sure you know we've all done that in our lives, trying to help somebody just make matters worse. Um, so the wisdom and compassion are like two sides of the, they, they both, to be spiritually whole, you have to you know, develop both. Is there any relationship between seeing emptiness and uh, having some freedom from um, yeah, the, uh, there's, um, I would say it's not exactly the same thing, but it's related. Um, conceptual thoughts are themselves empty, like everything else, and uh, it's possible to have uh, and to actually use and manipulate conceptual thought and still see them as empty and be, you know, it's not a, uh, having no thought process is not really the goal, but there's it, it is <coughs> useful to develop the ability to have to shut that off and have periods of time without conceptual thought, get behind and underneath and beyond conceptual thought. There's a constant labeling of what things are with conceptual thought that's not, it's just the name. Not accurate in terms of what they are yeah. in their essence. So I was just wondering if there, if there was some freedom from that that would be some you know, clarity. Yeah. Are you referring to that um, meditation technique of noting? It's just something I've experienced in deep meditation when you know I, I, I could have a sense of things more clarity about what they were yeah. and the conceptual thought that kind of dissipated. It's not like it's gone. Yeah. But it's it's not at the forefront where it's like there's the Christian, there's the this, there's the Oh yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah. 
yeah, yeah, getting getting beyond uh, getting beyond the labels. I think the the benefit of that um, that method of because that's how I started my mm-hmm. first meditation. I did for years Mahasi Sayadaw method of noting. I, and I think that's a very strong, powerful method. It, the benefit is to develop precision of mind. Because one thing that I think uh, med- meditators often can fall into is a kind of fuzzy general awareness that doesn't really, it isn't really productive of any clarity. And, uh, but it, uh, it's only, the noting is only a tool it's not the it's not the be all and the end all, and you actually get to a point where it slows you down, it bogs you down, and it's counterproductive. And you know, you get as you say, get beyond conceptual thought, right. and you're seeing things clearly in their own essence and their own nature without without labeling. That's that's uh, then then obviously you don't label; you just be with it. when kind of gripped by anxiety or whatever um, where I feel guilty because I'm like I should know that yeah, it's yeah. empty or I should yeah, know yeah, that yeah. like okay. I'm just like kind of <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know how to deal with it I guess because yeah. I, I still feel guilty o- over yeah well the, <laughs> yeah I mean that's I recognize the symptom but you have to re- look at the look at the guilty feeling itself as it's just another empty mental construction. Mm. You know, and don't don't take ownership of that either. This is just you know, another way of phrasing this is um, like people say, "Oh, I, I I feel guilty, or I'm guilty, or I'm angry, or I'm sad." You know, don't think of it that way. Think here is guilt, here is anxiety. Mm. Like you, then you're not taking ownership of it. Right. It's a phenomena you're looking at. So the, the clarity, the clear knowing mind is not anxious, it's not guilty, it's not sad, it's not happy, it's just knowing, right? Mm-hmm. And so you don't have to take take ownership of these, these uh, qualities, you can just see them objectively. And then that takes a lot of the juice out of them right away, <laughs> you, know, you can uh, diminish them. Okay, I think maybe we can wrap it up. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm.